Italy is the roots of the European artistic tree, running all the way back to the 15th and 16th centuries. This period called the Renaissance, which means rebirth, opened the door to artistic and intellectual progression that spread throughout Europe. Okay, here we go. Economic recovery. Especially in the 14th century leading up to this time of the Renaissance, there was an economic devastation due to the bubonic plague and the really terrible drop in population. But during this time, a new recovery began, especially through the Hanseatic League of Northern German coastal towns and new industries such as printing and mining and the great help of the Medici bankers who throughout Europe especially helped with a new growth in the economy. The social structure during this time was split into four estates, starting with the clergy or the high-end church officials. Next were the aristocracy or the nobility, who were the highest class, who owned much of the land. Next were the peasants or townspeople, who made up 85 to 90 percent of the European population. This included artisans and merchants. Lastly were women and slaves, who were very oppressed and were not given many rights at all during this time period. Now conflict in Italy, especially between France and Charles VIII and Spain with Ferdinand of Aragon. This continued conflict ended up leading to modern diplomacy through the creation of political ambassadors. One of these ambassadors was Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince about how the end justifies the means and a ruler should be feared rather than loved. Also, Balassar Castiglione wrote his book The Courtier during this time, and this was a basic guide on how to be a respectable gentleman in this era. During this time, a bunch of new ideologies came to light, especially humanism in its study of humanity that was seen in many art and literature pieces. In these literature pieces, especially in Petrarch's poems, in his use of the vernacular that really helped to spread the humanist movement, which is why he was called the father of humanism. Also, different subsets of humanism, civic humanism, which was the movement of humanists to get more involved in government roles, and individualism, the more so thought of you as your own being in this world. And then finally, Northern humanism was different from Italian humanism in its different view more towards religion rather than the Italian humanism that was very, very, very centered on that human and individualistic ideal. Along with humanism during this time was Neoplatonism, or the revival of Platonic works. An example of this is Pico de la Mirandola's Oration on the Dignity of Man, which explains how man is in the center of the universe, and man can elevate himself or go down with the animals. Now, during this time, there were a couple other isms, especially Hermeticism, which expressed the divinity in all aspects of nature, including alchemy, magic, theology, and philosophy. Also during this time was pantheism, which equated God with the universe, and secularism, which was the human-centered thinking rather than religious that really started leading into the period of the Reformation. Now, during this rise of humanism, there became a new emphasis on education, especially with the development of new secondary schools and the new idea of liberal studies. Now, this idea of humanism also influenced history in its new point of view. This can also be seen through Leonardo Bruni's History of the Florentine People and Gio Cardini's History of Italy and the History of Florence. Also during this time was the development of the printing press created by Johannes Gutenberg, who printed the first book, which was the Gutenberg Bible, that was pr printed in the vernacular language, which really started a surge of a new spread of information going into the new era of the scientific revolution and reformation.
Now, there was a new development in monarchies during this time, especially in England. After their 100 Years' War devastation, there was a civil war where the Tudor dynasty came to power and started with the rise of Henry VII to the throne. Now, like England, France was also crushed by the Hundred Years' War. This created a terrible deficit in the government, which Charles VIII tried to fix with his high tax. After Charles came, Louis XI, who brought in a bunch of new territory that was thought to lead to a new, strong, future French monarchy. During this time in Spain was the monarchy of Isabella and Ferdinand, and their reconquista in exporting all the Jews and Moors out of Spain. Now, the Holy Roman Empire in the German region failed to really bring in a strong monarchy. However, Maximilian I, through many strategic marriages, was able to contain their territory in Central Europe. During this time, there was a lot of corruption in the church. One man who was disgusted by this corruption was John Wycliffe, who believed the Bible should be the sole authority. This idea of lollardy was then spread to Bohemia through an, a marriage and really influenced Huss, who attempted to spread this idea in Bohemia, but he was unfortunately arrested as a heretic and then burned at the stake. Now, church reform during this time was very big, especially with the new rise in nepotism or appointment of family members into high church office. Now, one of these reforms was the Sacra Sancta, which said that the church gets all of its power from God directly. Along with this was the Free Quens, which established regular holdings of the General Council to make reforms. But, however, this proved insufficient in Pope Pius's Execrabilis, which condemned the council appeals over the Pope as heresy. So now we're going to enter the world of Renaissance art. So first of all, uh, well, Renaissance means rebirth, which we already know. So this means that culture of the Greeks and the Romans are being brought back into art. These artists during the Renaissance, their main goal was to imitate nature. Some of them even studied anatomy to get proportions of the body correct. Another really important factor during this time was patrons, such as the Medici family. They basically made Florence the cultural center of Europe. Wealthy upper class, they determined the content and the purpose of so many paintings and sculptures that they commissioned. So they basically ran the art world. Um, artists during that time also sought to be more than just mere artisans. They wanted to be recognized for their talent. They looked back on the medieval period before them and looked at them with disapproval because all of their images and sculpture were church-based. Faith, religious ideals, church, church, blah, blah, blah. And the Renaissance artists, instead of church, 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 focused a little bit more on humans, the glorification of the human, individualism, um, humanism, just glory to human. The four R's of Renaissance architecture. So there's Rome. These architects sought to bring us back to the classical Roman art and stuff, and they did. And we have rules. They sought to be more than just builders. They wanted to be artists, which is why they grounded their works in a bunch of magical theories and formulas. We have arithmetic, which is where they used math to create beauty and harmony, such as proportions and, you know, like geometry and perspective and stuff like that. And what else do we have? Reason. Well, they had rational basis in math and science and engineering to create our art instead of just being like, ha ha Paint from famous artists that were produced by the Renaissance period. Michelangelo, who did frescoes. Their style of mural painting on plaster walls. Um, what did he do? He did the creation of Adam. And he also did sculpture. He made the David. It was the first freestanding bronze nude ever. And it displayed this thing, it's called contrapposta. And look, look, see this guy? He's putting all of his weight onto this one leg. Um, it was influenced by Neoplatonism, which was like divine beauty and everything. That's probably why he's naked. Of Da Vinci. Look, I have socks for those too. He painted the Mona Lisa. Now this is a great example for one of the new techniques. 
pyramid configuration. I don't know, pretty big during that time. He also made The Last Supper. We have Donatello, who is another sculptor. He definitely focuses on capturing the old culture of the Greeks and Romans. Um, he too uses contrapposto. Macaccio, Macasio. Well, he's the guy who is credited with making the first fresco of early Renaissance art. And we have Raphael. He did the School of Athens. That work is a very good example of um, pyramid configuration as well. He focuses very specifically on taking us back to the Greek and Roman culture. He painted this to represent balance, harmony, and order. So he wants to focus on this new world of science. And you can see you have the two center figures, which is him focusing on the classical world. What's his face? The architect, Bruno, Brunelles, Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi. He did the Florence Cathedral Dome, which was the first to really be done. Major breakthroughs during the Italian Renaissance. They changed art for like ever. So first we have oil paint. Oil paint, it takes longer to dry, so it allowed artists to blend richer colors, smooth gradations of tone, and for people who don't art, that just means blending. And it made it distinctive from all of the art before that, and it was a basis for all of the art after that. And then there is perspective. Two lines almost converge into like a vanishing point in the painting to give the illusion of depth. The colors were muted and I, um, blah, 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 objects got small as things got further away. So we have the foreground, the midground, and the background. Pyramid configuration. If you have a line here, and you have a line here, it makes a pyramid, like a triangle, right? And it leads to the very center of her face. So this pyramid configuration leads to the center focus, a trend that we see very commonly in Renaissance art and then art from then on until we get to all the crazy minimalists and surrealists who just do their thing. Light and shadow, my personal favorite because it involves this word. Chiaroscuro, light and dark in Italian. So let's say we do have this pyramid, right? We have this, this painting of an Egyptian pyramid. Part of it is going to look darker than the others because it is not flat. So we use light and dark to make it look like this item is coming out of a shadow because shadows are a thing because the sun is a thing and if we don't have this light and shadow it cannot be realistic and what is the renaissance artist doing? So we talked about the Italian renaissance but now we're going to talk about <gasps> northern renaissance. So some of the artists in this period were they concentrated on fine detail. You will see in many of the artworks by Van Eyck, Van Eyck, whatever you he painted the Ghent altarpiece and Arnolfini and his bride. He was one of the first to use oil paint, which was another characteristic of many Northern Renaissance artists. Although you can tell by his paintings that his perspective or his grasp on perspective was a little shaky. Unlike Albrecht Durer, or however you say his name, who was a master with the laws of perspective. So the chosen media of the Northern Renaissance was oil on panel, oil on canvas. Everyone did oil on canvas. Now, their subjects portrayed peasants, working class people, domestic interiors, you know, like homes and mommies and daddies and children. They did a lot of naturalistic settings. Attention to surface detail. That was probably one of their main points. But the major location, um, a lot of Germany and other European countries that were just not Italy. Okay, well, you guys have learned the smarts. And you've learned the arts. You guys now know everything that you need for the Renaissance on your AP exam. Just strive for the five. Thank you.